right, so we are live here. Um, welcome everybody to episode eight of our restoration speaker series. I'm very excited to have a wonderful organization and people um, talking about something that I'm very interested in and I've always been interested in about with the beavers. Never really had too many opportunities to work with them in my personal career, but I've um, always been an avid fan and um, curious about, about such a curious creature. Uh, but before we get into that, I did have some housekeeping. Um, so just a little bit of background for those of first time listeners. Um, this series is a part of a new education initiative or project that aims to teach students and policymakers um, about tribally led large scale restoration projects that um, have an everlasting impact on our environmental damages that we are um, encountering. And um, using that as a way to kind of um, allow our young people to be a part of these movements and to learn in the um, immediate, like real time space, but also like long term to where they're, they're able to access these materials um, for future generations to come. So that's kind of the idea behind the speaker series. It'll be as resources for our future um, restoration curriculum. Um, this is kind of piggybacking off of our traditional ecological knowledge, science and management curriculum. And if none of you have heard of that before, um, feel free to access that for free on our website at californiasalmon.org. Um, and to quickly acknowledge the sponsorship, um, the people who sponsored this um, series, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them, both like with um, kind of coordinating the different speakers that come on, but also the resources to get the speakers on. Um, so very appreciative for ourselves, Save California Salmon, Cal Poly Humble Intercept. So that's Indian Natural Resource Educational Program and um, so diversity in STEM, um, as well as the Native American Studies Department at Cal Poly Humble. And the Yurok Tribe is a very uh, foundational partner in this project. So big thank yous to them for making this possible. Um, so with that, um, I would love to introduce um, some two very brilliant and also great personalities um, and just the little bit of moments I've had to share with them. Um, Kate Lundquist is the co-director of o Occidental Arts and Ecology Center's Water Institute and um, directs the Bring Back the Beavers campaign. And with her is her colleague and also co-founder of the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center and wildlife biologist, um, Brock Dolman. So I'd love to turn it over to Kate first to allow her to introduce herself in a little bit more depth and then we'll turn it over to Brock to do the same. So thank you both for joining us and I look forward to a great conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Charlie, and all of you out there. I really appreciate the opportunity to get to come and share here today some of the work that we've been doing. And as Charlie already said, Kate Lundquist here, and I've been with the Occidental Arts Ecology Center for 18 years now, and really just grateful for the opportunity to be doing this work up in the traditional lands of Southern Coast Miwok and Pomo, and it's just, yeah, super excited to share all the stuff you've been doing. I am not a wildlife biologist by training, but I have been working with one, and I work a lot in the advocacy and education space and really just helping to form partnerships and collaborations to really build uh, capacity of those who are interested in doing this kind of restoration, including a lot of our tribal allies. So with that, I'll pass it on to Brock. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, and thanks, Charlie and, and everybody there with uh, all the work you guys do. I've been just so inspired and, and really honored to be here with you all today. And, and um, yeah, like Kate, we uh, work at the Water Institute at the Occidental Arts Ecology Center in Western Sonoma County. And this will be my 30th year of being there as well. But, um, you know, beyond being just the, there's the, the biology side of this, but there's really just the the wanting to be an ally with all other species through, you know, through time. And, and so really looking forward to sharing with you some of the opportunities to, to partner with beaver as, 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 as one of our, our in a kin centric realm of, of reciprocity with our big buck tooth, flat tailed, amazing hydro geo engineer critter. So I'll turn it over to Kate and she's going to do the first half of the talk. All right, I will share my screen and we will take it away. I'm gonna get rid of my control panel. All right, are you all seeing that okay? 
I'm not hearing anything. Good. You can just tell Good. me. Good. Excellent. Thank you all. Well, here we are. Yay. Little cute baby beavers. So exciting. We're excited to be here to share what we've been doing. So as I mentioned, we are working in um, Southern Pomo, Kosmiwak, and Kishaya Pomo territory, and we are striving to uh, act as good guests there. And we're, these are photos of some of the um, collaborations we have done with the, our um, allies uh, with the Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria over the years, and excited to uh, share more about our work. So as Brock said, Occidental Arts Ecology Center is a nonprofit that's been around for 30 years and in near the town of Occidental and Brock and I, we uh, co-lead the Water Institute where we're really focusing on collaborating to do restoration all the way from the ridgeline down to the reef. And so the whole watershed system and really trying to uh, think think like a watershed and include all of the relations in our basin. And we do lots of different partnerships with agencies, tribal entities, other academic organizations, NGOs, and whatnot, and really trying to uplift everyone so that we can do this work together in a good way. And one of our uh, relatives that we're really uh, been focusing on in our watershed and in the North Coast in general is our coho salmon, since they have not been doing so well, and particularly in Sonoma County, numbers have really, really, really dropped. And we have been working for the last 20 years, really trying to think creatively and develop innovative solutions and really keep uh, our ears to the ground of listening for other different uh, techniques. And that's where... Um, this character comes in. So turns out that a lot of our friends and allies up in Oregon and Washington have been working really hard to partner with beaver to restore coho salmon in particular and other uh, fish such as steelhead and chinook and whatnot. And so um, really excited to get to have the opportunity to learn more about that and then share this information with our colleagues. So we're talking about the North American beaver and you'll know, note here that we've got some native uh, California tribal words for beaver, which is part of um, the information gathering that we have done over the years. And these words have been shared with us uh, with permission um, from our different allies that we've been working with. And in California for a long time now, um, some folks have been really excited about beaver, which is amazing. And there's been a lot of folks that don't even pay attention to beaver at all or have considered them to be a non-native nuisance. There's just been a lot of confusion around what's happening with beaver in California. And so about 12 years ago, we officially launched our Bring Back the Beaver campaign, as you'll see from my hat and the sticker here. Um, this is our logo, and we're trying to re, you know, uplift a species that was almost driven to extinction, similar to the grizzly bear, uh, but thankfully was not. And so a lot of what we do is, is what we're doing today is outreach and education, enlisting support of others to really try to help uh, figure out where we have beaver across the state through citizen science efforts and then supporting research and demonstration of restoration techniques and ultimately changing policy because we've got some rules that need changing so that we can do better beaver restoration. The first task that we had to tackle was this, this misperception that beaver are not native to California. Um, and that's largely comes from, uh, you know, as, as many of you know, the beaver were, were nearly trapped out um, before the gold rush. And so, you know, after all of the terrible genocide that was happening with native Californians, the settlers uh, come in from boat on the coast and then also overland in the 1800s, were trapping out beaver to make fur hats and send them across the world to, um, to support capitalism. And so um, this, you know, by the time we got to 1900s, people thought, oh, wow, beaver actually are only native to certain areas of California. So if you see my cursor, these hatch lines up here in the Klamath, Modoc area is one place they thought they were native, and then Central Valley of California, and then Colorado, but everywhere else they thought they were not native. And um, 
this has really influenced the way beaver have been managed. They have been treated like non-native nuisances. And so we gathered uh, people together to try to do all of this research. And we got some physical evidence of buried beaver dams that were carbon dated pre-contact and a lot of place names and historic accounts and a ton of ethnographic evidence that we gathered, including some pictographs of beaver in California and whatnot. And so this has really helped build the case that in fact they are native. And this map here, the green area is where we are proposing is actually the historic range of beaver and we should be treating them as such. Exciting that um, this next thing happened, but it also added to the confusion, which is, um, once California was a state, we started moving beaver around to repopulate them because back then what was called the division of fish and game recognized the value of beaver. And so they moved them all over uh, California, different places up to 1200 plus beaver were moved in California. And yes, they were in our remote forest released out of airplanes with in boxes that had parachutes that let them land softly and the boxes open on impact. And um, so we have our famous parachuting beavers and you can find actual video footage of the or film footage of this black and white online if you look it up, super cool. So a little bit about beaver, they are a rodent and they are semi-aquatic and they use the water to protect themselves because they're just this nice 40 to 80 pound hunk of meat with a really fatty tail that's tasty to a lot of humans, mountain lions, bear, bobcat, wolves, and coyote in particular. And so their jam is to figure out how they can create a nest or burrow as it's called for them to sleep in mostly during the day and also to raise their young because they have you know kits every year that, that they need to keep safe in there. And so they're either going to show up on a river and if it's not deep enough, they'll build a dam and in the river bank, they'll build a tunnel and then a den underneath a tree root. And that's where they'll, they'll rest. And that den's above the water. If the river's flowing fast enough or deep enough, they don't need to build dams. And if they find a still body of water, like a lake or a pond, then they're just gonna build a freestanding lodge out in the edge of it that makes it surrounded by water. And it'll also have this nice nest inside that they can raise their young. And you can see here, they've got all these canals that are going to their favorite foods, these uh, aspen right here. So they're creating all of these habitat manipulations just to protect themselves and their babies. Well, it turns out in doing that, they're benefiting a bunch of other species. Super exciting. So this is a picture of an amazing wetland up in the Sierras near Carson Pass, where the beaver have come in and dammed this tiny little creek and spread it out and turned this into a huge wetland. And then they put in secondary dams and they've got all these other canals. And so now this is just a haven for all those things that love water. So we've got fish, for example, Another picture of a coho salmon on our coastal systems. They really benefit from beaver habitat. So do sage grouse, cascades frogs, western pond turtles, Sierra Nevada will flycatcher, and many, many others benefit from beaver uh, habitat that they're managing. Another thing you hear about too is that when these beaver get into places where they want to build lots of dams because they have the space and the materials and it makes sense, that all of that turns into this huge wetland that then provides speed bumps for flooding, for example. So it's going to slow that flooding down, spread it out. It also makes those areas much wetter in droughts. And so they're way more resilient during drought. And then amazing work done by Dr. Emily Fairfax, who's in California right now, um, about what happens to beaver wetlands in these massive fires. They don't burn. This is really exciting. So they're providing these really important refuges for humans and other wildlife during fire and making it so that that um, that system can recover better after a wildfire. In places where there's lots of dams, like this area in South Lake Tahoe, um, this is Taylor Creek. And these dams are trapping all the nutrients that are coming down from above and it's helping to build the soil there. And eventually this could actually become a meadow depending on what happens with the flows. But in the meantime, it's creating this rich soil that's trapping that phosphorus and making it so that it doesn't go out to Lake Tahoe. 
And what that means is that it's beavers that are keeping Lake Tahoe blue and they need to get some cred. So we're going to adjust that sticker uh, that the Save the Tahoe League is putting out there to reflect that. They also, with these dams, they're slowing that water down, they're spreading it out, they're sinking it, they're storing it, and they're sharing it. And that makes it so that we in our arid areas here in the West who don't, who have a really long dry season, we're going to have water longer into that dry season. It's going to delay the release. And so it's not that we're necessarily water scarce because a lot of us get a lot of rain in the winter, but a lot of these little beaver dams, especially in our side tributaries, um, can help us stack up that water longer and keep it on the landscape for all species to use later into the year. This is an amazing project that was done over in Nevada near Carlin. And this uh, this is Susie Creek. And you can see the old floodplain is up here way high above. It's all covered in sagebrush now. And it's been super eroded. And now there's this inset floodplain. And there is hardly any vegetation down here. It's just water and dirt for the most part. And this was in 1992. And so um, conservationists got together with the ranchers and said, hey, would you mind pulling your cattle off on the hot season to see what would happen if we could get this to recover? Because there's some really important lahan cutthroat trout in here that we want to save. And so the ranchers agreed. And just by doing that, it allowed the vegetation to recover enough that it could grow up and be strong enough against cattle pressures for the rest of the year. And this was enough to allow beaver to return. So they come in and voila, it turns into this amazing lush wetland. And these ranchers are willing to go on record now saying, yeah, we used to shoot the beaver 20 years ago, and now we wouldn't have a ranching operation without them. So our motto is when we got those deeply incised systems that have been eroded away from bad land management practices, we got to fight incision with the incisors because beaver have got it going on and, and they know what to do. They've been doing this for 7 million years and, and we want to help them do it. So another really exciting part about beavers is that it's not just the dams. Everyone gets really focused on those for good reason. They're doing great work, but some friends of ours did a study up on the Smith River, uh, Marissa Parrish and Justin Garwood. And what they wanted to figure out is, well, what happens when beavers aren't building dams on these bigger rivers like the Klamath or the Smith or the Sacramento, you know, all these different big systems that we have. And so um, they were particularly looking at the Smith and they did snorkel surveys and they were looking at these bank burrows that are in the side of the, the riverbank here. And then these piles of sticks that the beaver leave out because they pull it in, they feed it to their young and the young nibble, nibble, nibble. And then they put the, um, they put the sticks out. Beavers are herbivores, by the way. I just want to say they're not going to be eating any other species. They're just eating plants and barks and roots and bulbs. And they love willow and anything in those, you know, in that family of trees, the poplars, the, the willows, the, the aspen and the cottonwoods and all of that. So sure enough, these piles of sticks ended up being these amazing places for all these other species to gather and also get protection. So the um, they were calling them like river reefs. They're functioning like a coral reef does where it's a place to feed, but also a place to get protection from, from predators. And all of these native California species uh, were found not only in the stick piles, but some of them were actually in the burrows themselves. Because when we get those super high flows and the salmon are like, oh my gosh, where do we go? We need off channel habitat so we don't get washed out to sea. They can actually go in these beaver bank lodges and, and hang out and have a little um, interspecies party in there while they're waiting for the, the, the flows to get down. So that's super exciting. Um, I do want to mention just quickly that we are working on some policy stuff. So currently right now, um, our California Department of Fish and Wildlife doesn't allow others to possess or move beaver. Um, they did pass, uh, the legislature passed in uh, 2019, the Wildlife Protection Act. So that made it so that beaver can't be rec recreationally trapped right now, which is not a bad idea since we actually don't know how many beaver we have in California. We are totally operating in the dark right now, and we need to know that information before we figure out how to manage them. And then, um, but the department does allow 
any landowner to get a permit to kill beaver if they're causing damage. And we filed a petition uh, in 2019 to try to get them to change the language around that to make sure that people are doing all they can to coexist with beaver before they're allowed to, um, to kill them. And so we're, we're in a process right now waiting for um, that. And then also some uh, endangered fish, coho, were killed up off the Trinity River uh, recently. And, um, and we're really trying to support uh, NOAA marine fisheries uh, in really making sure that uh, they're consulted before anything happens in, in an area where there might be listed fish. Um, and also there was a, a lawsuit uh, filed against the Animal Protection Health Information Service uh, um, because they hadn't been consulting uh, nymphs about, hey, we're killing beaver because landowners are asking us to, and um, nymphs would like to be checked in, especially if there's some really important fish there that um, need to be uh, taken into account. And the biggest news is that in June of 2022, the legislature passed a budget to create a new beaver restoration program, uh, which is super, super exciting. Up until this point, the department had been kind of lukewarm about beaver and at some points even resistant and hostile uh, <laughs> about beaver restoration. So this is a whole new era we're moving into. So there's a lot of opportunity and we're really excited. And so this new beaver restoration program is just being uh, developed right now as we speak. They're working on, uh, so they've hired the five permanent staff to do the program. They're developing a coexistence toolkit. They're creating a beaver management plan with input from interested parties, including tribes. And uh, they're planning for a beaver relocation pilot. And they're going to do their first one this year, which is super exciting. And they're definitely committed to doing that with tribal entities. And we've been working with them to help identify where those projects might be. And they are going to be having a public meeting on May 22nd from 3 to 4 to talk more about the new program. So if you're interested, definitely um, check that out. And there was a Beaver Reintroduction Act that was introduced this year by uh, Assemblymember Devin Mathis. And that bill, it's a little wonky. Uh, we gave some input and um, there is some room for improvement for sure. And so far, some of our suggestions were considered, but not all of them were integrated. And so our position has been that we will support the bill if it's amended. And um, so far, it's passed through its first hoop, but it's now um, being sent to the uh, suspense file, it's called, because it's, it's going to cost a lot of money for the department to enact this. So um, stay tuned for that. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to um, my dear co-director Brock and let him carry on with the show. Let me stop my share. Great. Thanks, Kate. It's all very fun. Um, super exciting work here. All righty. Is that up and running there? Okie doke. So yeah, it's a uh, Kind of on the on the beaver bill thing, there's that classic saying that anyone who has faith in, in uh, sausage and politics has seen neither made, and they certainly haven't seen a food fight after a bunch of beavers in the cafeteria. And so, that beaver bill is a little bit of a a little bit of beaver sausage there, but hopefully it's gonna it's gonna work out. So, um, let's see. So, kind of you know part of part of this whole idea of really thinking about thinking like a watershed, really thinking holistically, thinking through time and, and engaging with an organism like, like beaver and really thinking about beaver. We often like to think of beaver as, as a verb and instead of a noun, sort of the person, place, thing to really honor the, this idea of process. And so a lot of the work that Kate and I are doing is in collaboration with um, a number of organizations, agencies, entities, universities, nonprofits, NGOs, tribal organizations, that's really bringing forward a kind of a new ethos, if you will, in this so-called work of restoration that's really honoring, again, process-based restoration. And again, beavers as agents of, of keystone processes that the water cycle, the carbon cycle, fire cycles, life cycles, um, relationship cycles are really about verbs. And so there's some interesting work and in this uh, um, book on the left there, the Low Tech Process Based Restoration of Riverscapes Design Manual. A number of our colleagues out of uh, Utah State University there. 
There is actually a whole beaver restoration guidebook, as you can see here, that uh, some of the federal agencies have put together. That's very comprehensive about what beaver restoration, the components of beaver restoration. And I think a lot of the way we look at beaver restoration is it really is about an integrated relationship. And so as Kate mentioned, a lot of the work we had to do in the beginning was, yes, beaver are native to the state. Yes, they were widely distributed. Here's some papers to put forward that idea. Then there's a lot about the benefits. And yes, the beavers are, are provide so many benefits and not just utilitarian benefits to us people per se, but to the whole system. So the water quantity and the water quality and the carbon, the biodiversity, the resiliency, the flood control, the fire protection, all of these amazing benefits. So that really brings us to our primary relationship as um, from the Bring Back the Beaver campaign the, is the coexistence piece. So if we've got beaver in a place that are doing well, then our first responsibility really is to figure out how to coexist with those beaver, how to support those beaver and being better beaver where they are. So how do we enhance what they're doing in that location? Um, and, and can we then get into the question around um, if, if those beaver are acting in ways that we aren't happy with, um, well, I'll show you some slides here about opportunities for non-lethal coexistence and some of the ways we can work with some of the habitats and behaviors of beaver that um, annoy some folks who happen to be occupying historic beaver habitat, in all honesty. And then how do we support in, through enhancement those beaver expanding themselves throughout their watershed or, and we'll talk a little bit about relocation as one of the tools in the toolbox and also mimicry. How can we um, act like beavers to support support beavers being better beavers. Um, so in the coexistence realm, again, one of the things like Kate showed is that beavers are notorious for building these dams. And she went over a bunch of the reasons why. And yet when they build dams in certain areas and they begin to retain that water and impound it and create their classic beaver ponds, that may inundate certain things that humans are doing on the landscape. That may flood roadbeds or that may flood other land or you know other things. And so Folks get mad when beavers flood out their, their, their operation. And so you'll see on the upper left there, there's a thing called a, a, a flexible pond leveler. It's, it's basically some people often refer to these as beaver deceivers. They're kinds of devices where you can basically put a tube through a beaver dam by notching the dam a little bit and placing this pipe at the elevation that you can live with the inundated height of the pond without flooding out whatever it is you're trying to protect. But you want the upstream end of that pipe to be in this protected cage and it's all anchored in. And then basically you can fake the beavers out, keep water in there for them. They won't plug it up and, and get the best of both worlds. So you can save two beavers with one pond leveler. Um, there's other devices when they try to block culverts, trapezoidal fences, when they try to cut down trees, you can wrap the trees. There's a really cool strategy around mixing sand with latex paint and painting it on the trees to because the beaver don't like to chew it. And then on the, on the right-hand side is a cross-section of a really neat device that the Sutter National Wildlife Refuge folks invented and then Kate and I've been working with them to um, adapt that and, and really promote it. We call that the beaver back saver, I'll mention in a second. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, in a different version of a pond leveler. And this is really, we're uh, just about to go uh, launch this publicly, but you all are getting a preview of the link to a brand new website that includes a video that we produced about this, what we're calling the beaver back saver. And you'll see that it's really about saving beavers, but it's also about saving the lower backs of all the people who have to clean out these water conveyance structures that get blocked up by the beavers and end up injuring their lower backs. So it's a win-win situation again, like with, with our tagline here about saving time and money by preventing beaver from blocking water control structures. So check that video out, super exciting. We're really, we're really excited about it. And as is the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Fish and Wildlife, we're very excited about this. And this is really, for folks living down in, in, in lower elevation parts of the state, the, the valley bottom, Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley, uh, wildlife um, refuges, duck clubs, the rice growers, uh, gravity-fed irrigation, ditch irrigation type folks that um, have their conveyance structures and they're really easy to plug up by beavers. Um, the enhancement side, and here's a beautiful photo by Damon Ciotti in a place called Doty Ravine, where there was a, there's a beaver dam, as you can see there. And then for various reasons, um, 
big flow events, maybe that beaver dam might be more prone to, to blowing out or parts of it blowing out. And so you can see the stakes that were placed in the beaver dam just to help it be a bit more resilient and, and retain and get the benefits of the beaver. So we can kind of partner with the beavers to reinforce the dams and, and support them in the context of a working landscape oftentimes and, and, and other things. And like Kate mentioned, there's also other things to be done with changing grazing regimes and, and, and planting additional food and sprigging in willows. So there's lots of opportunity to, to really partner with beaver. Um, and this is a wonderful uh, slide here showing this incredible project that the Placer Land Trust. So we're in the area of Lincoln. So go um, a little bit kind of northeast of Sacramento towards Auburn and, and near Auburn, a little town of Lincoln there. So we're kind of foothills, valley bottom-ish um, Sacramento Valley area. And so if you go look in the upper uh, left there, you can kind of see that image from 2007 to 14, where you've got the red lines showing you the constrained channel where they kept the creek as a single threaded channel and they put levees on either side and they really straight jacketed that creek in there, which is classic. Um, the green lines on the outside show the historic floodplain. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service were asked to partner with the land trust and Damien and his team came in and said, we'll work with you, but we rec see that you actually have beaver in the system and you've been killing beaver because you have various reasons for that. And we'll be willing to work with you, but you have to sign a beaver peace treaty and stop killing the beaver first and foremost. Then we'd like to support you with some funds to remove parts of the levee to allow the stream to reconnect with the floodplain, especially when the beavers start damming it up and helping move that water laterally outwards. And then we can reinforce some dams and we can add some vegetation. And so they've done this work. And that image in the lower right there is literally just within say three or four years later for less than $50,000 worth of investment by federal tax dollars. And they've increased the wetted width and amount of surface area of the system well over a thousand percent. 10 to 12,000 uh, to 1200 percent increase in wetland just by simply stop killing beavers, remove some levees, strengthen a few dams and plant a little bit of vegetation and then let the beavers do the work. And that's what we're really interested in. Um, we have been working, Kate and I, since 2015 with the Thule River Tribe down in the southern San Joaquin and the Porterville area, southern uh, Sierra Nevada um, area and with um, council member Kenneth McDarmond and other tribal citizens there who have very interested in bringing beaver back to their reservation. And, and what's really cool if you look in the upper left there is that is a pictograph that's actually on the reservation and it's estimated to be a 500 to a thousand year old beaver pictograph. Kate and I've had the privilege of being able to see this. It's about three feet long. It's one of only two known pictographs in the state of California. The other one is a Shumash related pictograph up in the Puyama area sent uh, Los Padres kind of back behind Santa Barbara. Um, and so in the meantime of the process of working with the department, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, supporting the tribe in their, in their dream of bringing back beaver, we've been collaborating with the tribal citizens and their forestry departments and their fire fuel load departments, the road departments on managing some of the uplands, the in-stream habitat, controlling erosion, helping restore mountain meadows, because it really is an integrated piece of work. And so that's an amazing and inspiring um, tribal-led initiative on their own reservation, which is, a, is an amazing place. Anyone is ever invited to visit there. Another uh, tribal-led organization entity that we've been working with is now we're up in the North Fork Feather. So we're kind of in the Northeast of California, say near Chester area, Lake Almanor. And this is the Maidu Summit Consortium. It's a, a, a nonprofit um, intertribal, there's multiple federally recognized Maidu tribes and other tribal citizens working. And they their, their tribal territory is very large, but uh, recently, as in 2019-ish or so, there was a, a PG&E land back, if you will, and about 2,200 acres of land was, quote, given back to the tribe in, in, in a co-management agreement with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the, and the Feather River Land Trust. And it's an amazing meadow. They, uh, the Maidu people call it Tazmam Koyom. <clears throat> and, and so a number of, of, of agencies, organizations, a, a group called Swift Water Design have been really collaborating with the Mighty Summit Consortium on doing what we often think of as pre-beavering, 
like the process-based restoration and, and working with fire and fuel load, limbing, thinning, and bringing that material into the channel to act like beavers, to slow it and spread it and sink it and store it and share it. The Dixie fire burned this area off a, in a significant way. Interestingly enough, a lot of the process-based restoration wetted areas didn't burn, just like how um, Kate showed with Dr. Emily Fairfax's work, because that wetted Water doesn't tend to burn. <laughs> and so this is a really exciting opportunity. And in both the case with the Thule River Tribe and with Mighty Summit Consortium, there's significant interest in bringing back beaver into those areas. And so there is an active conversation with the department about that. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, relocation it is really something that is um, critical and it's an important tool. And, and one of the tribes that we take most inspiration from and have learned from is the Tulalip tribe. So up in Washington state actually. And that's really where um, Kenneth McDarmon and a number of the Tule River tribal, um, the folks on the council and other tribal citizens. And in fact, um, assembly member Devin Mathis, who's in the Porterville area down there, they went and spent time with the Tulalip tribes and, and their wildlife biologists and Molly Alves. And they actually were able to trap beavers. They learned how to sex the beaver by smelling the, the glands and verifying the difference of the females and males and, and then actually move the beaver. And that's in some part why Devin we got, has become such a beaver believer and introduced his bill. But thankfully a lot of that knowledge and information is, is being, we're collaborating with the Tulalip tribes down here in California to assist the, these tribal-led beaver relocations down here, just super fun. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to switch a little bit just to offer up that while we think about watershed restoration and where beaver have, it can inhabit watersheds is often the big meadows or, or the perennial blue line streams, which often is only 10% of the watershed area. And yet the majority of a watershed is uplands. And so how can we manage the uplands in a good way so that the flow of water, the quality and quantity can protect the habitat to improve the beaver habitat below. And that looks a lot like forest limbing and thinning and fire and fuel load. And so here's just some images of what we've been doing, taking inspiration from beavers. And we're what we call uh, fewer trees and more forests with good fire. So we have clear, cold and copious creeks for coho. So we're limbing and thinning those dog hair thickets. And then we're acting like beavers and placing that material in the creeks. We had to get permits to do that work because we're placing a quote hazardous material in a waters of the state. Although we're all upland waters of what are called first order streams or class three streams, if people know what that is, they're, they're seasonal, they're ephemeral, they don't support fish per se. Um, and, and then just to say that a lot of that material is we're now taking the problem of fire. So we're really taking our fire fears and our water woes and connecting those together through what we call our fuels to flows program. Limbing, thinning, gully stuffing, packing. And then through that process, we're mitigating the head cut erosion. We're reducing the channel incision. We're producing cleaner water by sediment reduction for the coho downstream. While we have upland fuel reduction, we're sequestering that carbon in situ as a sponge that increases upland water holding capacity, and then the forest grows its roots into there and improves its own resiliency and reduces evapotranspiration. So these holistic integrated approaches, we've really been inspired um, by beavers and, and have been working on that. And another tribal led project that we're super inspired by is the Tribal Eco Restoration Alliance known as Terra. It's a, a group of um, primarily Homo tribal folks out of Clear Lake area, um, Scotts Valley, um, Rancheria and, and Robinson Rancheria primarily and others. And this was a project that um, we worked with them on where we're limbing and thinning Douglas fir that's encroaching into black oaks on behalf of improving black oaks because of the importance of black oaks and acorns and all the things that black oaks do. And using again, that slash that's not trash, it's a beneficial biomass by then strategically placing it in these massive gullies for all those benefits I mentioned. And so that's been a really fun collaboration. And a lot of that really for us just looks like, how do we really see the benefit of, of these landscapes as we work towards more of a regenerative relationship with them that we're not just making all that material go away. So we really think about integrated holistic approaches and, and multiple ways to respond and, and how to work in collaboration with these systems and really restore the, the water cycle and the carbon cycle towards supporting life cycles, both in the uplands so that then the lowlands where the beaver 
live and the salmon live are better. And we've been doing a lot of that work, to be honest with you, at OAC in a, in a collaboration with an amazing group that through the North Bay Jobs with Justice, these are primarily immigrant farm workers, indigenous peoples out of Mexico and Central America and Guatemala who are up here being exploited in say the vineyards in our case and, and working on a traditional ecological knowledge inspired um, ecological restoration workforce training program that these folks are taking leadership on and are really stepping it up. So that's super inspiring work. And I'll just leave you with this one to say that um, Here's a link to our booklet called Beaver in California. There's a wonderful book that our dear friend Ben Goldfarb wrote called Eager, The Surprising Secret Lives of Beavers and Why They Matter. That's really um, wonderful and features a chapter on our work called California Streaming. And then also another organization that's reasonably new that we helped co-found is this California Process-Based Restoration Network. Here's the link to the website. There's an upcoming meeting on the 22nd. And this is, I guess, statewide effort that's super inspiring as well. And with that, um, I thank you for your time and I'll stop sharing and we've got some time for Q&A. So, all right. That was incredible. Wow. Uh, just from, you know, the, the different effects, the ecological effects to the social effects and just the different projects and collaborations that you guys have been able to kind of be a part of over the last you know couple of decades. Um, I think that was just really empowering to to see all the great work that you guys are a part of. Um, answered a lot of the questions that I'd had, you know, like how how do beavers you know increase biodiversity? Like how are they that um, uh, what do you call it very dependent species? Um, so I think those questions were were answered for me. Um, I haven't seen any questions, so I allowed the audience to kind of think about it a little bit longer. But one of the questions that I have, um, I know that in my upbringing, I was able to get an intern with the uh, um, Mid Klamath Watershed Council, which is kind of a fisheries department. So I was able to, you know, monitor a lot of the like juvenile coho salmon, right? And counting them and recognizing that they did prefer those slack water areas and even been told like, you know, this is where the beavers role came in big time for them is because they had that protection protection for predators and things. So I'm wondering, and I think you guys touched on this, but maybe expanding more about like what level of um, youth engagement you guys might've had, or maybe some collaborators have had. And if you have any experiences that you'd like to share on like how that felt for kids, you know, to be a part of such an incredible project, you know, cause any kid loves being outside, especially when they're able to learn some wonderful things too. Well, I'll just say um, yay for, for Mick Wick, made the plan with Watershed Council. We love that crew too. We're just hanging out with Taz Soto and Will Harling at the Salmon Restoration Federation just a couple weeks ago with them and talking about Boise Creek Project and some of those off-stream storage ponds that like you you might have been part of. Um, I, I, I'll I speak, I think for myself, I mean, always see where while we've had a school garden teacher training program, we work with youth and school garden frameworks, ecological literacy frameworks, I would say in the, the beaver process-based restoration space, it's been less explicitly youth oriented, although I think there's um, folks bring youth around or, but when we've worked with some of the tribal organizations like uh, down say at Tule River, um, there are definitely in their natural resources department, there's tribal citizens and youth there. And then, and then um, young adults, if you will, who are, are being paid, they're working on the crews, they're, 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 they're skilling up, who've been working, we've been collaborating directly with them and doing trainings with them. And that's been super inspiring. And to be out in, in the field intergenerationally with the elders, with their parents, with the youth, and, and really see that, that connectivity intergenerationally has been amazing. Um, what else, Kate? Yeah, just to add to that, a lot of the process-based restoration techniques, some of them are really just family friendly. And so it's really just, um, you know, we're not bringing out the big yellow toys because it's not that level of project. It's not necessary. And so it's really heartening to be able to have a project where we can have a bunch of volunteers come out all ages, bring the dogs, the Frisbee, the kids, you know, whatever it is, and just get involved and, and act like a beaver. You know, we all grew up, you know, any of us who had access to some running water, you know, probably tried to stop it in some way. So it's just 
this inherent desire that we all have and and we're all pretty good at it as it turns out so it really lends well to community building and community involvement and just skilling up our youth and giving them access to something that's meaningful and and um, actually makes a, a change and so you know through our process-based restoration uh, network we do some field trainings uh and try to you know make those accessible to whomever wants to come out and um and some of our practitioners who are doing this professionally uh, try to provide you know, opportunities as well um, for folks to come out and learn what it's about and to get involved and get inspired. That's great. I was, I, I was just going to say that on the um, some of that upland work I was just showing you, some of the fuel load limbing and thinning and the, the gully stuffing and the, and the floodplain connections and the uplands, um, that's super family friendly and, and youth friendly is with respect to maybe those folks aren't running the, if, it's, if chainsaws are needed on the front end, but the biomass itself, the limbing, the thinning, and the ability to pl hand place that into the gullies, into the channels to make these perpendicular structures across the channel. And in fact, I just got an email today from a fifth grade teacher at our K-8 public, uh, public school to come out next week and do a, a walkthrough. They have 30 acres of forest. And then they want to pair up kindergartners with fifth graders. And we're going to design a whole bunch of very simple little upland water holding sediment um, trapping structures that they can build with hand and they don't really need sh uh, sharp tools and things. And so that's going to be super fun. So we'll get the kindergartners out next week. That's incredible. I'd love to be able to, you know, have something similar, you know, because I think that that's something that we're trying to do. Like we recognize the, the level of um, responsibility and the importance of connection to place that youth can have in those opportunities and a lot of times you know this western school construct can really um hold kids back from what they feel like they're like of their abilities and so the more we can get them outside the more we can get them to see like what they're capable of i think the more empowering it will be both in the for the natural world but maybe even in their educational experience as well so many times we can get them to like boost up their confidence and belonging in educational spaces and outdoor, um, I think the better off we're going to be. Uh, so we did have a question. I think it's a great one from the audience. Um, and so either of you could answer it. Um, how do we incorporate beaver restoration into regional dam removal projects? I'm thinking of the Potter Valley project and its future, which has huge implications for two watersheds. How could beaver restoration help? <laughs> big question it's awesome um i can start a little bit and brock you can take over because you you know more about this than i do but just i mean it's great because we have beaver in the eel already and they're up there near van arsdale and just whole already there in that zone so you know um once those dams come down, there's going to be a lot of work for them to do and, you know, just really making sure that they have the vegetation that they need and, and whatnot and access to sub tributaries, you know, they're going to have to avoid that big sediment slug, obviously, that's going to come through, but I, there's lots that could be done in, in making side tributaries beaver ready so they have a place to go and they can hang out once those dams come down and they're just going to be already situated with water stacked up and food stacked up and just like boom, they can like start getting back into main stem and and doing their work and i would say you know they're also in the russian river and you know they brought themselves back you know it was not an assisted migration those beaver came over from sonoma creek and made it into santa rosa creek you know via the oakmont golf ponds in sonoma county to get themselves return themselves to the russian river and so um they're not that far up yet they're not in potter valley as far as we know um but you know who knows we're we're there's like all sorts of creative thinking going, you know, around of like how we can, you know, work with beaver in certain places where their their work would be really well served. So, um, opportunities, possibilities, but let's let's make it um, beaver ready so that they can do their good work. Brock, what would you add to that? Yeah, like Kate said, I know that yeah, there's beavers in the Rice Fork, which is upstream of Lake Pillsbury. So, to the degree that with the Potter Valley project and PG&E's choosing to stop you know, uh, their electric production there. It, if and when, hopefully the when question, um, Pillsbury comes down the big dam and Van Arsdale below that and whatever happens to the tunnel. Um, you know, it, it, I think again, beaver 
the, the big main stem river, they, as Kate said, they may not be dam building there, they may be doing bank lodges and river reefs, but it is gonna be, and I think kind of what you mentioned there, Charlie, like in the Klamath, and obviously with Klamath dams coming out, um, the main stem of the Klamath, we all, that's, that, that's one piece of the work, but it's, it's how can Beaver then help kind of augment the edges, those off-channel ponds, the, the side tributaries, where the, 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 the juvenile salmonids may often rear and, and pull out. And, and so it's, I think beaver are gonna be helpful in just increasing the functionality of the sort of edges and the ecotones of the main stems of these big rivers as they, the dams come down and the flows get reconnected and the water quality and the toxic algae hopefully goes away and the fish are then returning the beaver are just gonna help create more nurseries, more edge effect, more complexity in the interstitial zones of floodplains and reconnections and side channels and, and, and backwaters and, and oxbows and that kind of stuff is hopefully, you know, will be where they get to be, play a supporting role. Yeah, thank you, Kate and Brock. It's always enjoyable to see your presentations and I appreciate all that you do and keep up the great work. So I think that that's something that I really appreciate about this presentation is just the different um, visual aids. You know, I think that the idea of this is to to get this into as a resource for students. And so I always encourage presenters to have those visual aids so that way they understand like, OK, this is how beneficial this, um, you know, this beaver dam is for the entire like I really like the, it was just so powerful to see the burn edges and then like just bright green, lush, you know, healthy. And just thinking about all the animals that like went there knowing like they're they're gonna be protected. So I think that was just such an incredible way to, to capture the essence of the importance of, you know, beavers. So I definitely appreciated all, you know, your presentation. Um, um, and so, wait, put more in here? Yeah, no, no. But I did have another answer. So I know that you guys mentioned there's a lot of different policy work that's going on and <clears throat> as well as just projects that you said that volunteers can join in. So I was wondering if you guys wanted to share a little bit about ways that we could support, you know, policy procedures or efforts and if there's any volunteer opportunities um, to, you know, to get that hands-on experience, it'd be great to, to share. I can start and you can take over Brock. Uh... Policy-wise, right now, we're just still, like I said, with that bill, we're just waiting to see what happens with it. Um, you know, certainly we're going to, you know, we have a mailing list ourselves, which, Brock, I didn't put that into our presentation, but that's where we, we would put out announcements. Um, if you just go to our OAC.org website, there's like a follow, and then you can sign up. You have to sign up for both the OAC one and the Water Institute-specific one. You'll get two for one. <laughs> um, but that's where we'll be putting words out in terms of just like, hey, you know, this is what's happening with the bill. We'd love support if, you know, if if we need it. And we, we've definitely written several letters of support already um, before the program was developed. And, and it's really helpful for, for us to have beaver allies from different organizations, different um you know, tribal nations, uh, you know, whatever is, it's so great to have folks who are really interested in supporting. So if you're one of those folks and you want to just send us an email, be like, hey, I'm willing to like be, you know, considered for sign on letters or anything like that. Absolutely let us know and we'll put you on that specific list. That would be super helpful. And then otherwise, um, yeah, I mean, tune in, stay in touch with 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 us and with the department as they roll out this new program. They're going to need input, and we're really pushing them to make sure they get as many you know diverse voices represented. And so, um, you know, definitely show up for that process if if that's your thing. Um, it'd be really great to have your input on you know what are some considerations that the um, department should be thinking about with with restoring beaver and developing their program. And um, so, Brock, any other policy opportunities you want to throw in there? Well, I, I just want to, you know, lift up the fact that um, from Governor Newsom down to uh, Resources Secretary Wade Crowfoot, and then ultimately down to Chuck Bonham, what we continue to hear, and then at the staff level at CDFW, is um, they are centering tribal um, initiative and to whatever the de de degree the state can show up and be supportive. 
I mean, you know, making amends for a long, too much time not being that way. So that's what we keep hearing. So every time there's a conversation about beaver relocation or coexistence, they start with, is there a, a, an appropriate authentic tribal nexus here? Which is why the relocation pilot to the degree either one of or both happens this year and next will be tribally led ideally with Mighty Summit Consortium and Thule River Tribe. And so I think, um, I know with Yurok there, there's a lot of conversation with Fisheries Department and, and, and the new at blue, you know, the Blue Creek acquisition recently. Um, and so I think that's another interesting angle is really finding those places where the, within the sovereign tribal opportunity to kind of step up and initiate the, the collaboration. Certainly the process-based restoration network that we showed is, is, is really, it's new, it's exciting, and it's looking for ways with workshops, with trainings, with collaborations to be participatory. Um, and so I, I, it's kind of a moment where it's, it's kind of wide open and, and you can be entrepreneurial with it and, and initiate and invite and engage and really just kind of create our own new space because we're making it up right now. It's all literally brand new and that's super exciting. Yeah, and through the network, there definitely, you know, we have these kind of every two or three months meetings, and that's where, you know, opportunities are announced and whatnot. So it's a good way to stay in touch about volunteer opportunities there. And sometimes folks are looking for crew members. So it could be like a job. If people are looking for uh, an exciting outdoor job that's doing some amazing restoration work. Um, so that's a possibility. And like I said, you know, there's two practitioners in particular, symbiotic design and, and swift water design, who um, they sometimes take volunteers out onto their projects to see if they want to learn more about the work and see if they're interested in, in training to become a crew member as well. So it, there's some pretty awesome green jobs out there right now that are available. And there's a lot of money right now in the state that's going towards this kind of restoration, nature-based solutions, you know, really centering tribal-led efforts, like Brock saying, um, uh, so we really want to build capacity, and that's part of what the network is about, is just building, you know, different communities capacity to, to start doing this work and learning from those who have been doing it, you know, how to permit it and how to, you know, get it off the ground. And, um, and there's, there's a lot of room for improvement, you know, because we're all busy out there doing the work. And so it's, we're just kind of like doing this network thing uh, in our spare time, but it's, it's, it's really exciting what's coming of it so far. And, and we will be having a training this fall. Um, there's two kind of different trainings that are forming up right now. One up in Siskiyou County, kind of Scott Valley area, uh, focused on folks that are kind of more in that watershed zone. I don't think just Scott, but kind of more that Nor NorCal um, zone. And then uh, the other one will be again at Tasman Cuyom, uh, Yellow Creek, and that will be sometime in the fall. And um, hopefully there'll be a, a tribal component to that as well, um, as there often is. So check it right. out. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's such an incredible way to, to exit out. Um, I actually had a kind of like a silly question, but maybe you guys touched on it. How many different types of um, beavers are there in California? Is it just one? Or a super three? great question. And I'm sorry, I didn't clarify that when I was talking. So really there are only two beaver in the world, the North American beaver, and okay. that's Castor canadensis, and then the Eurasian beaver, Castor fiber. And they're only native to Northern hemisphere. They didn't co-evolve in the Southern hemisphere. And we do have in North America, potentially different strains, but none of it has been genetically tested, so it hasn't been proven. So right now, they're just all lumped into one species. But in the distant past, they are not so distant, 150 years ago, they used to break them all up into tiny subspecies, but none of those have been scientifically proven. And so right now, just the international community only recognizes one species in North America. But there's room if people want to get into gene, you know, sequencing. Mm -hmm. They did it for the Eurasian beaver, and it went from eight thought of subspecies to actually only two in that case. And so we don't know yet how many we have in <laughs> North America, but they're all they can all interbreed, and they're all doing fine um, with that. So mm -hmm. great question. No silly questions <laughs> when it comes to beavers. <laughs> and and maybe one thing that could be behind that question, I'm not sure, is that versus the the the, the species specificness about that, 
um, we often get asked the question of, oh, I've got a bank beaver or I have a lodge beaver. And as if those are different beaver and, and it's really like they're all Castor canadensis. But what's really inspiring about beaver is that they're, um, they're the supreme generalists. So they go to Sonora, Mexico. They're going all the way up to the Arctic Circle. They're in the high mountains. They're in the urban ditches. Like beaver, if there's food and water and cover, they'll figure it out. And so like Kate said, if they, if they don't have a big lake to build a big, a classic stick lodge, then they'll burrow into the bank. But it's all the same beaver. They're just, they're just, they're supremely right. uh, adaptable. And, and, and they're like, you know, they're just tricksters. They can pull it all off, but they're all same, the same beaver. But your opportunity, or not yours personally, but our collective opportunity is really then just say, all right, great. What are the conditions conducive to this critter? And how do we support them to being better beavers in, with whatever trick they got wherever they are? And if you ever hear anyone talking about mountain beaver, it's a totally different animal, not related at all. It just shares a common name that's unfortunate because they, they're totally different. <laughs> different strategies. There, different there are things names. called Aplodontia. And there, there's only that one family, the Aplodontia, one genus and one species. They're a super cool, very interesting critter, but the word beaver in their name is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that's such a great way to conclude a mysterious um, species in that we don't know if there's more or less of them, you know, so I think that that's just a great way to conclude, conclude today's session. So I again want to thank both of you for taking the time out of your guys' busy schedules to, you know, support such a great cause and um, if anything else comes up, I think we'll let you know and um, like and that goes both ways if anything else comes up in your guys' world. Um, and you think of us for it in any way, let us know. And we continue to, to nurture this relationship that we started here today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. And this will be available on our um, YouTube page as well as in the case that folks had to drop off or want to come check it out later. Um, so again, thank you. Um, and that is all for our restoration speaker series. Um, thanks again to our uh, sponsors from Cal Poly Humble as well as your York tribe. Um, and um, look forward to seeing what comes of this uh, restoration series and in, in our restoration um, curriculum. So thanks again. And um, that's all for us. All right. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks so much.